So, uh, uh, in a in a in a short uh, uh, definition of controlled environment agriculture, uh, any uh, man-made structure that uh, enhances plant growth, enhances animal comfort and animal productivity, and uh, saprophytes, that's even mushrooms and things like that, they, they will all be considered con con controlled environment agriculture. The field is uh, very vast and it's uh, uh, becoming bigger and bigger as we go along. And as you'll see, um, uh, uh, it's difficult to cram everything in uh, one hour, but I will try our best to give you a good uh, feel of this subject uh, by the time you get through. Next slide, please. So uh, controlled environment agriculture is a uh, amalgamation of several uh, disciplines. And uh, it's uh, whenever you form a team uh, to do uh, activities in this field, you should have uh, these fields always represented. Uh, and uh, yeah, because all of them have a continuous contribution to this uh, subject matter, and each one brings different aspects and values to this whole field of uh, controlled environment agriculture. And I will elaborate one by one uh, how each subject brings in the value and how commercialization uh, is enhanced by each subject matter, each discipline. Next slide, please. So um, let us start with the uh, structure and uh, materials uh, we have uh, you know different formats in uh, in this field as a, from the structural point of view however in india we just find one type of structure right from you know kashmir to kamanyakumari and from uh, northeast to gujarat and uh, this is where uh, people like me don't seem to understand why this happens uh, because a, a greenhouse structure or a controlled environment structure has to be designed taking uh, local conditions into view. So uh, it's not one size fit all. And that's probably one of the reasons why India has one of the highest capacities that we built in, in, this, uh, in this field in the world. But our productivity is almost negative and most of these so-called poly houses are failing every day because uh, it's just one size fit all. I mean, you can't have the same thing that works for Kerala and for Bihar, we can't do that. So um, every structure has to be designed, keeping in mind uh, local conditions. And every area has its own lead condition. Somewhere it's maybe the rain or what uh, precipitation of different forms are the lead. Some, some place it may be sand and dust. Some places it, it just may be heat and too much of light. So there are different uh, locations that uh, throw out different challenges. And the structure needs to be designed according to that environment. And uh, there are certain uh, very basic designs. Uh, of course, one is uh, the lean to, uh, which is a, a small, uh, you know, structure which any university or college can easily make is inexpensive and you can start your research projects there and uh, and I don't see this type of a structure anywhere in India when this is quite a you know inexpensive a small structure very efficient when it comes to uh, certain uh, uh, param parameters the other one is a gutter connect or ranges that we have which is very good for commercial growers and uh, we see some ranges, but they're in a very different format and the different variations of these ranges. And the other ones are standalone uh, structures uh, that we uh, find in India, sometimes uh, very rudimentary hoop houses, which actually perform very well uh, for their condition for keeping the plants a little warmer during winter. Um, so uh, uh, in the commercial side, uh, I think uh, choosing the right structure for the right location 
is key and uh, it will uh, enhance productivity and the objective of that operation. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Now, there are certain lead factors that uh, I uh, explained earlier that you have to consider. Uh, uh, one is, uh, of course, the uh, light. And uh, now light, let me explain a little bit more on the light side. Uh, hold on, something is messing up with my computer. OK, so uh, let, let's start with heat. Now, that's the predominant uh, 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 factor that in India we have plenty of heat and remember plants as such they just need uh, you know uh, a, a small fraction of light and we also if we humans too need a very fra small fraction of light uh, something from you know 350 nanometers to about 800 nanometers that's all we need but from the sun we're getting all the way up to 3000 nanometers and most of it beyond 800 is just heat and uh, the way to look at it is uh, this the the thing that you cannot see we don't use that's all heat that we have to get uh, basically rid of in some format so here comes the engineering challenge how do we get the light in without getting the heat in so that's a big challenge for engineering today is uh, uh, developing materials do, developing uh, techniques that uh, we just get the you know 350 to 800 nanometers in, which is sufficient for plants, and beyond 800, we can keep out. So that's a very big opportunity, and that can be very well commercialized. Now, cold again in certain parts of India right now in, in the north, we are suffering from a cold wave, and certain activities, uh, things like uh, germination of seeds and. Uh, so we, we are suffering. We cannot do it in the present structure. But if we have a heated structure where we have some sort of a bottom heat, uh, maybe due to uh, using some boilers and water, or maybe just electricity with just simple heat pads and keeping so we can get early germination and a season can start off. That's again a very big commercial uh, uh, indication that nobody is doing uh, because uh, now we are going into a season that a warm season is coming up so if our seedlings are ready beforehand as soon as the warm season hits uh, you know we can plant and we can be early to market keeping out rain that's a big challenge in the northeast and, and uh, so uh, along uh, so rain again uh, wherever there's heavy rains we need to design the greenhouse and place it in such a place where it's slightly high because invariably you have seen you know structures made where water is flowing right through the greenhouse you know uh, in during rainy season now that, that, that should be happening so rain again uh, gives us opportunities uh, but still is a threat in certain uh, ways um, wind now when we talk about wind uh, we're talking about the damages da damages done by wind and every structure needs to uh, withstand at least some wind gusts. Uh, I think 200 miles an hour, if you can uh, prevent it, you can design structures to do that. Then all your uh, structures along the coastline, uh, you know, because coastlines are very stable atmosphere environments to grow food at in. And uh, if you do structures that way that can withstand the winds, then we have a good uh, winning situation. Some parts of India get uh, sleet um, and hail um, if hail is to be contended with then there are lots of technologies available uh, hail nets and uh, uh, lots of technologies today available but sleet is something that uh, it's tough it comes in uh, quick it comes for a very short time so there should be some materials developed that uh, we can keep the sleet out because once the sleet comes in then it drops the temperature very rapidly and that hurts the plants. So uh, we need to uh, come up with uh, some sort of a material that holds the heat in a little bit. Polycarbonates do very well in this uh, when it comes to sleet. 
Um, snow, again, designing a greenhouse. Uh, well, recently I saw a project in, in Gujarat that had a, a, a kind of a Gothic style uh, uh, greenhouse, which generally you do where there's snow because you don't want to peak uh, during in, in wind, wind uh, laden areas. So, um, so snow uh, uh, is a big factor in northern uh, parts of India, uh, especially in Kashmir and places of Himachal. So, a special greenhouse needs to be designed uh, where we can handle the snow. And uh, the, the Western world is pretty good at these designs, uh, but in India we haven't really uh, done much. So, there's a lot of opportunity when it comes to uh, uh, greenhouses in the hills, uh, especially that can handle snow. Certain areas have salt problems, especially coastlines. So we need uh, structures and materials that can handle salt. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, hold on, something again. Okay, something keeps happening. Ah, blowing sand uh, in the desert, uh, the desert areas of Rajasthan, and along with sand comes fine dust. And I haven't seen a single uh, structure today that can handle uh, the sand, uh, blowing sand and dust uh, adequately. Um, but technologies should be developed because uh, we have a big area. Uh, this is a big problem of dust and sand, uh, especially in the north during May. Uh, uh, we have this problem. and. Uh, the problem, if you really look at it uh, from the field, we grow crops in the field, but uh, in the field, the wind takes care of a lot of uh, blowing dust and it knocks it off the plants. But in the in controlled environment agriculture, that we don't have such mechanisms to take care of, uh, you know, blowing sand and uh, sand settling on food. So we have to be very careful of trying to design structures that uh, help us not to bring in sand and dust inside. Then humidity is a big problem uh, in certain parts. Uh, uh, again, uh, trying to get rid of humidity is uh, a very expensive uh, task. Uh, dehumidifiers right now uh, don't really work that well. They, they do work well, but they're very expensive. Uh, low humidity is it's a very easier problem to solve. Uh, because we have high pressure foggers and misters available that can immediately bring the humidity up. But trying to get excess humidity out uh, is a problem in India. And then that's again a very big area of uh, commercialization that can happen. So, uh, all in, on this slide is there's opportunity and there's commercialization in every aspect of structure making in India. We haven't really started. Uh, at all, we are in, at a very nascent stage in uh, controlled environment agriculture, and uh, sky is the limit here. So, if we can develop technologies uh, that can take care of these uh, aspects, uh, we will greatly enhance productivity and uh, the welfare of uh, entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. Now, this is just a, a basic uh, structure just to get you aware of, uh, you know, the components of a greenhouse. Um, there's purlins, there's gables, there's sidewall. These are just basically just to give you a terminology. So if you do interact with uh, uh, some vendors or some people who don't um, understand, so you can tell them about the terminology or, uh, um, so everybody gets on the same page if you use the right word. So these all, uh, the t terms are all uh, industry specific and uh, we uh, use these to explain to people um, so these are standard if you if you're a structural engineer the, these will be very easy these words are just quite regular for you but for others uh, maybe you should uh, take a note of them and when we're talking about controlled environment agriculture these words would uh, come in handy um, to explain to people next slide please Again, uh, as I was uh, saying, there are these uh, different structures, uh, and we've, I've already gone through them. Uh, but uh, each one is has a different purpose. Okay, uh, 
if if you want a very commercial type of a, a greenhouse, then we go in with the uh, gutter connect uh, structures. You know, if you want a very simple type, then you go with a lean to, or if you want a midway between, uh, then you go in uh, with a, a free standing. Uh, and each of them are very specific in their uh, uh, objectives. Uh, so uh, I, I, maybe at an advanced level, we can go into details about each structure and what their capabilities are and different mo modes of designing them. Next slide, please. Here again, uh, some more information about uh, your uh, structures. And uh, so uh, here, let me point out one thing, and uh, that's from the, um, uh, so far, whatever we've used, it's just simply, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting from uh, materials from the West, and we really haven't uh, come up with our own. So um, it's time we start uh, developing our own uh, industry and uh, getting materials and, uh, you know, everything done in India, and which we are quite capable of. So there's a big, big opportunity in trying to um, get materials now. Um, the skin of the greenhouse. Now, there's just one skin available, uh, two skins available uh, for us readily. And of course, black eggs. I mean, actually everything is available for us, but popular are uh, polyethylene and polycarbonate. That's poly sheets, what they're called locally, and polycarbonate, uh, which is also available. And these, and they are being used, but there's several other materials for the skin that could be used that we don't, uh, we haven't come across or um, we haven't explored. And that's where a big chunk of uh, this industry can, uh, uh, the engineering people can help us out trying to develop better materials. And what we do, in, and I'll explain a little bit uh, how to look at it uh, in, a, in a different way when it comes to um, different materials and uh, how do we select a material? What are the qualities it should have? And that is a, a big field of commercialization uh, for this industry. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, now. <coughs> excuse me. Now, uh, there are several ways uh, you can uh, uh, make these. Now, some of these are small structures. If you want a PVC conduit pipe structure, which is going to be a very inexpensive uh, structure, but they're going to be very temporary in nature. But there are others which, uh, with different materials, inexpensive ways you can make them. But these generally have uh, uh, approach uh, good value in the hobby markets, and they work for a very short time. Uh, they get degraded very quickly, and they bend and because of heat load, they tend to get uh, deformed and uh, no longer strong. But if you want a quick, uh, uh, you know, maybe a six month deal, then you can put these up and uh, get your objectives met and move on. Uh, but looking at it at uh, a bigger uh, picture, uh, there are certain materials that uh, uh, need to be incorporated, rather certain designs uh, of materials that need to be uh, uh, really uh, come up with, uh, which we'll explain slightly in the, uh, for example, um, the next slide, please. I think that has a, okay. Now this is what I meant by um, uh, what we need to uh, look at. Uh, just give me one more thing. Okay. So these are the qualities of uh, glazing, what this called. They also call the skin or the outer covering. Now, uh, basic uh, regular stuff allows it should be flexible. It should allow light and, uh, you know, sim uh, single wall, double wall. These are all features of uh, uh, the materials, material that could be introduced. Uh, so if you can find a material that satisfies these qualities, then you can uh, easily introduce them to the market. And there's a big scope for that. Next slide, please. OK, now how do we look at the material? What, well, 
light is a very important indicator. Now we'll explain about light a little later uh, in, the, in the presentation. But uh, there's a word called PAR here, P-A-R, okay? And uh, that stands for uh, photosynthetically active radiation. Now that is what is, we should be using PAR all the time in the greenhouse industry or controlled environment agriculture. Um, somehow we keep using lux and um, foot candles and things like that. Now lux and foot candles are great terms, but they are meant for photography. Uh, they are more for human eye than plants. PAR is what we require and PAR is measured where you uh, basically measure from 350 nanometers um, to about 400 and then uh, that's your blue light and then the red light on the other side and uh, plants do take in a little bit of green and yellow but that's very low they mainly do well with uh, red and blues a human eye in, on the other hand does well with green and yellow so we see green and yellow more and plants see blue and red and that's what they use. So uh, PAR meters should be always at hand and we should, and each plant has a different requirement of PAR. So that's why when you're designing a structure uh, and you're choosing a skin or the covering, you have to consider the PAR value. Uh, so that's a very important term uh, in this uh, thing. And there I've shortlisted the PAR values, um, what, like for instance polyethylene which is a very popular uh, covering in india uh, has you know a good amount of power is 85 uh, percent and it lasts about two to four years um, and that way you can see uh, each uh, each uh, skin has its own power value maybe you can take a note of it or uh, if you interact with me at a later stage i'll give you more details on it uh, next slide please so more on par and different, uh, you know, uh, materials again. Uh, but the objective here is uh, to bring up more materials and if possible, uh, bring out materials that can simultaneously, you know, give us energy. Um, let's say we need, uh, if we compromise on the par a little bit and we can create more energy with the covering, then uh, we have a win-win situation in India because uh, we have a lot of light in India. We have a lot of free light, which a lot of places in the world do not have. And uh, we should be very fortunate. We are very fortunate that way. So um, we should make use of it. And uh, greenhouse skin, if, if people could develop uh, with solar uh, cells in it, and uh, that gives us a little bit of shade and, uh, and give us, gives us the right amount of power coming in, that little blend if somebody can figure that out uh, then that would be a very big uh, uh, you know very good product for the country um, now best of course in this whole thing is the glass uh, followed by my favorite is the polycarbonate and then the other materials that i like uh, but glass is too expensive polycarbonate is again expensive <clears throat> so uh, uh, we uh, we'll have to come up with more materials that uh, uh, help the industry a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now, uh, <clears throat> so now let me talk about the technicalities of each of these and uh, and where the opportunities are, where the uh, how we can commercialize different aspects of these uh, uh, very important factors. Now, let us go with light first. Now, light can be basically divided into two parts in controlled environment agriculture. Um, the one light is what most people understand it is a photoperiodic light. And it it's basically uh, uh, deals with the circadian cycle, night and day, you know, 12 hours, 12 hours, that's the basic. But uh, plants see and plants not see, but sense light in very different ways. Now, longer, they, they, they sense more of the darkness than the light. I mean, of course, we call it day length, 
but actually plants respond to the night length more than the day length. It's actually the same side of uh, two sides of the coin. So let's say <clears throat> we have, uh, and, and this one, uh, these type of lights, the photoperiodic lights, are very simple lights. They can be simple incandescent lights, or even a fluorescent light would work. Uh, you don't need intensity here. You just need the illumination. Okay. So uh, let's say you want, uh, these days you have a plant called Ponsetia. You, you find it all over uh, the country in nurseries and they have the red calyx. Now you can delay that, you know, that you can actually time it uh, that when do you want the red calyx uh, to your uh, requirement. Generally, Ponsetias are sold uh, on Christmas Day or one day before Christmas Day. So I would like all my plants to get ready five days before Christmas. So I can actually do that with photoperiodic lights, which are very low intensity lights. So I trick the plant, I give him daylight, give the plant daylight, and then I turn the lights on uh, for a little more, uh, let's say at four o'clock to seven o'clock, and the plants will be will remain green. And when I want them to be red, I go back to my old cycle. I don't, don't turn those plants off. So they begin to sense longer night lengths and then they'll turn uh, change color. So this way there are several ways, especially in floriculture, where you can uh, alter photo periods and uh, different types of light sources, which is big, big business. OK, uh, but the other part of light is the intensity light where I talked about power uh, that belongs to the other side where the energy is made. That's uh, the photons that come in from the sun and and your leaves are the uh, you know basically photon collectors and then take that light uh, photons and convert it into ATPs and then that's your you know uh, power source for the uh, plants. So now what type of lights uh, uh, help in this is there's several different types of light sources, and we have to discover more. Um, so let's start with uh, earlier. We uh, they tried growing plants in incandescent light. It didn't really work because it has a lot of yellow and green, and uh, little of uh, red and blue. So it did work, but not as much. Then the next generation of lights came in as fluorescent light, which is a good light source, especially your T5s and T8s. They give you a whole spectrum, but not enough of it. Okay. And good thing about fluorescent light, you can stick it right over the uh, plant so that uh, the heat generated is not much from fluorescent. So it's it's easy to grow, but it's great to use these for propagation in tissue culture for a small plant propagation for micro propagation. Uh, fluorescent lights do very well. The next range of lights are halibids that you have sodium vapor, mercury vapor. Uh, these uh, would not suit the Indian conditions too much because they generate a lot of heat. Uh, they're quite ideal for northern latitudes where they need the light and the heat and the plant gives and the light gives them that. Um, and they're very expensive and they're very energy thirsty machinery. Uh, so, uh, but one, uh, two other light sources that have a lot of potential is uh, sulfur plasma lights and uh, magnetic lights. Now, these lights are uh, yet to be uh, really researched and brought uh, to, uh, to the industry. But if somebody can quickly research them and bring them out, it'll be, it'll be very good for us uh, because we can begin to use them. Uh, but the other exciting, the big exciting news in lights is the LEDs. But again, uh, the right type of LEDs. Uh, you know, uh, if you're aware of the LED business, uh, when they make the uh, LED lights, they do a quality control and they put it into three bins. They call it bin A, bin B, bin C, and that process is called binning. And, and uh, but for our purpose, we need all the lights from pin A, because we want quality. Okay, there's of course light quality is very important for us uh, in, in uh, uh, horticulture. 
and uh, just any light won't do. I mean, there's reds even in the B and C, but that's not good quality lights. It looks red, but uh, they're not good quality. So quality of red or blues uh, in the bin A from the bin A, which is actually very expensive, is what's required uh, for us. Um, uh, there is, again, LED combinations uh, with the use of LEDs. You could actually, uh, I would really recommend this for specific uh, uh, applications, uh, especially for medicinal plants, because it enhances anthocyanins and beta carotenes. Uh, uh, if you give them a different light treatment, uh, then uh, blue light uh, stunts the plant, so it's desired wherever stunting is required. Um, so we can use light wavelengths to alter uh, plant behavior morphology, uh, and uh, that's very good commercial business, and especially uh, when it comes to certain very specific applications. Temperature is a big, big uh, factor in India. We, uh, we are suffering a lot from this temperature, and as I said, uh, we need the light, uh, which is a very small spectrum, but most of it is, is, is heat, it's short wave radiation. Uh, we really don't need all that. So, and that's what hurts us in the green industry because the greenhouse effect takes in and, and it gets too hot and now you gotta cool the whole thing out, you know? So we need proper technology. There are uh, innovations in this area uh, from cooling technology to retractable roof systems and that help a lot, but, uh, but these are expensive. These are expensive. Uh, maybe if uh, glazing uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, coating on the glaze, uh, some colors that are easily washed away, which they use in the West, uh, or some other material uh, that uh, different types of shading and uh, to keep the temperature down. Uh, again, going back to the structure when it comes to temperature control is uh, most of the greenhouses I've seen in India are, uh, they have a, the shade cloth inside the greenhouse, which is, uh, I don't know, um, from the engineering point of view, uh, uh, the heat is already in the greenhouse. So now by putting a shade in, you're not taking the heat out. Remember, we don't, uh, we do need the uh, 350 to 800, that's not hurting us. It's the heat outside this wavelength is hurting us and that's already coming in. It's not, the shade is not helping. So if you put the shade outside the greenhouse, maybe that might be a better option. And if you keep a, a gap between the skin and the, the uh, shade cloth from the outside, then you get uh, some of the heat, you know, deflected. And with the lights, only the night light that's needed coming in and not heat. So there are different methods of mediating temperature. Uh, fan and pad is uh, industry standard where you have um, uh, walls that are continuously wet on one side, which are honeycomb design, and then you have uh, big fans that suck the water air out through the pads, and it cools the atmosphere at the same time, giving humidity. So uh, temperature is a big opportunity, and uh, if we can come up with technologies with uh, uh, temperature, then uh, it can be really taken to market. Humidity, big factor. Uh, so getting out hum uh, different inexpensive humidif dehumidifiers, different ways. Uh, the only way right now to deal with humidity is airflow. So you keep moving the air, uh, so it, it helps a lot. Uh, it's like uh, blowing uh, air on your skin. It feels cold, colder. Um, so, but, um, so that's what we do. We put in fans in the greenhouse, uh, HAF fans, they're called uh, or, no, or horizontal airflow fans. And they help in uh, helping us with uh, take, keeping the humidity in check. Carbon dioxide. Now this is a very important uh, tool that uh, we need to use, but different sources of carbon dioxide uh, generation is needed. Uh, right now, carbon dioxide is uh, not easy to come by. Uh, of course, uh, some people just do a simple base and acid reaction and 
they get carbon dioxide and that's uh, that's a method it's also used a lot in the greenhouse industry uh, but better methods need to be uh, there uh, uh, carbon dioxide generators and uh, uh, stuff like that but uh, uh, the opportunity lies in the sensing of carbon dioxide and the correct application and uh, this is very relevant in uh, urban farm which i'll explain uh, later on uh, you without carbon dioxide, I doubt you'll be able to produce uh, anything indoors as an indoor farm. So you have to give uh, carbon dioxide and uh, the ambient carbon dioxide, which is about 350 ppm, maybe 400 now, uh, uh, is, uh, is adequate, but it gets saturated very fast. So you have to give supplemental uh, carbon dioxide and uh, wherever you have low light conditions, uh, carbon dioxide is necessary. So a generation of carbon dioxide is a uh, big, big, big opportunity. And uh, if somebody can make machines uh, that generate carbon dioxide, uh, it would be great for the industry. Oxygen. I mean, all plants need uh, oxygen in the root zone. Uh, we um, uh, roots actually uh, thrive very well with uh, very oxygen rich uh, root environment. And it also uh, helps us control the, um, uh, 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 oh God, something happened again. Uh, also helps us control the, uh, uh, okay, where are we, where are we, where are we? Okay, I've lost my, uh, lost my uh, presentation. Uh, Okay, I'm managing it, sir. sir. Okay. Uh, uh, Sorry about that, gentlemen. Somebody has shared some screen from their side. Okay, again. Uh, go go uh, little back. Go, yeah, go for I would the back. Request the participant to kindly uh, put their mics off. Go, go further back. Uh, I would need the yes, slides sir. to go back a little bit. Okay. Go back for the back for the back. For the back. Uh, so, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking going the other way around. <laughs> going the other way around. Sorry, go the, go the other way around. Okay, let's stop here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, uh, uh, we were at uh, this slide when we. Uh, lost each other. So um, coming back to uh, oxygen. And uh, so oxygen is uh, very important for root zones, as I said, and uh, but good quality oxygen being introduced uh, uh, to the root zone. Of course, there are te technologies that are there. We bubble in water with different forms. Um, you know, different diaphragms could be manufactured and designed that give us gives very fine uh, microns of oxygen being infused into the uh, water source so that uh, we cut down on pests and we cut down on and then enhance root growth. Now, water is, of course, in, in controlled environment agriculture, water is very, very important. We, uh, in fact, we rely on good quality water. And that sometimes is uh, difficult to come by and uh, and one of the things we don't do in our industry in India is uh, calculate the cost of water per liter or what we're using. Um, so we need to, and if there can be some method of uh, doing that um, and taking out, and most of the water sources, at least uh, I see in, in the Noida area or uh, in Rajasthan, uh, it's very high uh, TDS water. So uh, we have to use technology like RO and um, things like that to uh, mediate the water. However, uh, 
water uh, testing of water is very important for this industry and an easy test if possible could be developed now what i meant by easy test what mean by e an easy test is let's say i have a water source which has uh, 120 parts per million of calcium and uh, that can help me i mean so i don't have to add calcium to it so now when i put an ro machine it takes everything out it even takes that free gift of calcium uh, you know, out of the water source, and I have to re-add my calcium, I have to re-add everything else, and then give to the plants. So if some method can be used to develop where um, I could be a little more selective, where, okay, I have 120 ppm of calcium, so I want to keep that, but the rest of the thing like sodium and chlorides, I can get rid of, or at least keep them to some extent. So if possible, uh, so it becomes a little more interactive with water so that I keep some and I discard the rest. If some RO system or some other machinery could be developed, then uh, that would be a very big win-win and save a lot of money for the entrepreneurs uh, because then they don't have to spend money, uh, which is basically free in the water source. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now, uh, Let's get back to uh, some of the other uh, uh, aspects of uh, horticulture. Now, uh, in horticulture, let's say uh, plumbing is a very important topic, uh, especially in controlled environment agriculture. Now, plumbing basically would mean delivery of the nutrients or uh, whichever material, even sometimes air, or even carbon dioxide, you plumb them all in, or even heat, you plumb it in. Uh, so uh, different technologies of plumbing, so far we've uh, uh, concentrated on irrigation for plumbing, but we do need to come up with uh, uh, plumbings for air. We need to come up with plumbing for heat. We need to plumb, we need to plumb everything in into the greenhouse. Uh, in a very systematic way. So plumbing has a very big opportunity again in the greenhouse industry and professional plumbing uh, equipment is needed. Then again, uh, <coughs> pipelines and I mean, these are again materials that um, uh, need to be improved on. And uh, we already are doing pretty well with uh, drip lines and pipes and things like that. Uh, but uh, we need a little more uh, uh, control over this. Uh, for instance, in control environment agriculture, you need we need uh, to know exactly what we are putting in. And in a drip line, it's it, it's always an estimate, you know, uh, because uh, drip lines are long, and uh, when I pressurize it with my equipment, then uh, the uh, drip, dripper, drippers closer to me tend to give out more water and drippers on the far end get less water. And, and that's why you get, get a wavy type of a growth pattern in, in greenhouses. So the right type of plumbing, if, if you would uh, run two mains on the two opposite sides and connect the drip line to that, then that gives a little more control. Then the emitters need to be uh, uh, slightly designed, they get clogged very easily and uh, they tend to um, uh, not perform over some time because again, high TDS water is going in there and it is salts, you're already dissolving certain nutrients and that all dissolve, that, you know, cakes up on the uh, emitters and that makes it very inefficient. So um, we need to uh, improve on that and there's a big opportunity there, especially in controlled environment agriculture. Now, automation, big, big, big opportunity. I mean, uh, uh, this is where uh, engineering has to come in and uh, concentrate on uh, uh, automation of all types. We need everything. Uh, we don't have anything. We have very little automation uh, right now present in the country. And this can be a very big uh, commercial opportunity for us. Now, op uh, automation in water, of course, 
if you have some automation on the nutrient side um, with different types of dozers. Uh, but on the other side, for example, seeders, uh, pot fillers, transplanters, harvesters of different types. Um, then you have uh, different, you know, ways of applying things, uh, sensing different other parameters uh, besides uh, your usual temperature, light, and uh, you know. Uh, so we can sense uh, certain let's say pheromones in the air or for pest control. So there's a lot of opportunity when it comes to uh, plant uh, uh, automation. Now, we have uh, uh, outside the country, we have, uh, you know, uh, sensors that are embedded or just put on the leaf. Uh, we have sensors put on the fruit. We have sensors put on the stem, in the root, in the soil. So I'm getting inputs from everywhere so I can even manage my temperature of my plant, the internal temperature of the plant, which uh, we don't consider at all. So if uh, the right type of nasal, uh, needle nose thermometers or sensors can be uh, developed, that can, uh, then we can monitor the health of the plant, the temperature, uh, what they should be at and what they are at right now, the fruit temperature, the leaf surface temperature. So all these inputs will give us, uh, take us to where we are. Uh, just to get you an example of productivity in India, India we have, you know, we have maximum pushing at, uh, you know, uh, uh, kilograms of tomato per plant. You know, that's on the higher side, uh, you know, but outside in controlled environment agriculture, We are pushing at about what, and that's because they have all these. So uh, plant automation is big, big, big uh, opportunity. And uh, okay, plant automated system. Sorry, it's a part of that. Uh, so uh, if I can have the next slide, please. We also draw on uh, uh, a lot of. Uh, 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 okay, let me quickly ask, uh, uh, Mr. Arvind, am I doing okay on time, or uh, am I exceeding my time? No, no, uh, you are on time, sir. Uh, we can have it uh, for next. I'm on time. Yeah, next couple of minutes. Also, yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll quickly. How many minutes are you giving me more? Okay. Though the session is up to twelve, so uh, according to your convenience, you can finish it at any time. Okay, so I'll, I'll, that means I should wrap it up quickly. <laughs> okay, so uh, so uh, the other other aspect that uh, in the greenhouse in the uh, control environment aspect aspect is uh, in the in discipline is uh, the contribution of pure sciences. Okay, uh, if we deal with light, we deal with uh, different types of uh, chemicals and chemistries, with diff different types of biological systems uh, in our. Uh, day-to-day uh, -day functioning. So these disciplines also help us a lot of data in and enhancing them uh, has also is also uh, very beneficial to the industry. Next slide, please. Okay, now uh, let me uh, concentrate on uh, this big aspect of uh, uh, control environment, and that's uh, of course the plant sciences and uh, horticulture. Now, this is uh, by far the largest uh, uh, subject in this uh, whole thing. And uh, uh, horticulture, especially when it comes to uh, control environment or agriculture, the different formats it takes. So, uh, um, and then uh, of course, plant physiology, agronomy, these are more uh, topics that uh, I can elaborate on. But uh, let's go ahead with the next slide. So we can start uh, diving into the. Uh, so there, the horticulture could be, uh, you know, divided into different types of 
systems. And one thing very popular, which uh, Poor Nagri is very good at, is hydroponics. Now, hydroponics, of course, is the is a uh, uh, technique where you give the uh, nutrients through uh, water uh, through your nutrient solution. But different types of systems. Now, uh, let me go quickly over the systems. One is the NFT. That's a net film technique, and this is where I have seen a lot of NFTs being uh, installed in the country, but uh, hardly any of them are really right in the sense. It, it, there should be a film of water flowing there, and there's a reason why it's a film, because uh, that helps the root growth um, a lot, but it doesn't help root bulk growth. So you have just enough roots uh, for the plants to grow well, well and thrive. Now they have made a hybrid system. Most of them I see where they run uh, a water uh, about an inch. Uh, so basically, that's a cross between NFT and a DFT. Here, the roots become tend to become very large, which is a very inefficient way to do things. In hydroponics, you do not want very big roots. Uh, you want smaller roots, more efficient roots. And most of the other systems, hybrid, I see they get very big root balls. And big root balls will get knotted, and then you have uh, patches inside that will begin to rot. So the right installation of the NFT technique is very important. NFT, where you put in water from one side in a flat channel, and it comes out of the other side. The rate of flow should be about one liter a minute. And, and, uh, and but NFT is good to grow all small rooted plants. It is excellent with lettuces, uh, salad greens, um, Strawberry seems to be performing pretty okay with NFT. Um, but wherever you have small rooted plants, you have NFT is the favored uh, technique. Okay. Then you have um, a vertical system. Now, uh, this is a great system, but uh, the problem with that is uh, uh, as you go higher, the light levels on the lower tiers tend to reduce. So, uh, and especially you have uh, shading from the top. So your plants in the top of the vertical system tend to grow bigger and shade the plants below it. So light doesn't get through the lower plants. So uh, it's a tough thing to manage uh, a vertical system uh, in India because uh, lights don't get there and it tends to be a little expensive. A Dutch bucket system uh, is a great system for large rooted crops and you find crops like tomato, capsicum, beans, you know, uh, eggplant, brinjal, uh, and any big rooted plant will grow very well in a Dutch bucket. Now, a Dutch bucket um, is a very, uh, I wouldn't recommend a Dutch bucket to people unless you know what you're doing because uh, the, there are plants that grow over six months and eight months, so you carry the risk for that long. And um, if there is any disturbances in any environmental conditions, you, you might lose everything. So in India, where the know-how level is slightly lower, I wouldn't recommend Dutch bucket in the first uh, instances till you get more experience. But good opportunity in the Dutch bucket uh, system. Uh, you could modify the system to a uh, uh, upright bag system, uh, which is a li little less expensive, uh, and you can uh, learn there and then graduate to Dutch bucket. So the uh, the next system is um, a deep water culture, great system, but uh, you should use this for uh, uniculture, one type of crop. Um, now again, uh, uh, this is a a system where uh, you have a tub of water, which is about one foot deep, which is all nutrient solution, and you float the plants on it. So one tank should have one type of a plant species. If you're growing lettuces, then surely grow lettuces. You shouldn't be growing basil in the same place. Uh, uh, this system is very inexpensive, and it's uh, my go-to system. I, would, I, I love to install these and operate these uh, and they do very well. They're very inexpensive. 
and they perform excellent. Uh, but uh, the uh, plumbing has to be right, uh, the water quality has to be right, and the hygiene in the greenhouses have, has to be really right. Now, so um, the next one is um, okay. Hold on, Mike. Um, any media-based system. Now, although a dust bucket system is, is also a media-based system, so whenever you talk about um, media-based system, the media has to be prepared right. There, there are some uh, medias that we have that is uh, already made for us, like Laker balls, Hydroton, and, uh, rock wool, and things like that. Uh, Oasis cubes. Uh, they have started manufacturing in India, so we have that also. Uh, so media-based system, but when you're taking advantage of what we have, so what we do in Purna is we uh, use agricultural waste to make our own media at any local place. If we have, uh, you know, let's say peanut hulls in, in Punjab or Gujarat, then we like to use peanut hulls. Of course, we do uh, a lot of curing of those hulls. If we have rice hulls in uh, UP and Bihar and Bengal, then we like to use rice hulls um, mixed with other ingredients to bring the costs down. So uh, media-based systems for India is a great opportunity. Um, and I think we should be going that way more than any of the other systems uh, because uh, commercialization is very easy and uh, we're very inexpensive uh, when it comes to media-based systems. The media becomes inexpensive. Again, ebb and flow is also a media-based system where you bring in water from the bottom and you retract the water, which is a very efficient system. And uh, it works very good uh, with uh, several crops. And uh, although setup may be a little more expensive uh, with the ebb and flow system, but it performs excellent. And then you have the... Um, Okay, something went wrong. Okay, the other system which in India we uh, should be adopting, which most of Western countries are already adopting, and we have a we have a heads up on this one, is uh, uh, flat bags. Uh, so the flat bag system is uh, uh, great for growing tomatoes and for capsicum uh, and uh, but if you combine it with the right type of drainage and uh, right type of nutrients and right type of management it will give you very good results uh, I hardly see any flat grow bags in India I I see some but there's a lot of opportunity in this uh, field uh, of the media system next slide please Now these are some of the pictures. Uh, that this is the NFT growing basil in uh, Pune. Um, this again, uh, lettuce growing in NFT. And then these are the vertical systems on uh, uh, which I've already explained to you and and uh, flow methods and um, uh, dust buckets. Next slide, please. Okay, now let's uh, concentrate a little bit on uh, <clears throat> two, two, two very big opportunities in India. And uh, one is the aeroponic system, uh, which is right now being used for uh, potato propagation. Uh, but uh, we have uh, run a, a aeroponic uh, facility here uh, just near Noida uh, and uh, uh, for growing vegetables. And uh, of course, the input costs are phenomenal. If if people could get in and uh, try to reduce the costs of cost of this uh, infrastructure, then uh, maybe we could have a very winning technology in aeroponics growing vegetables because they perform very well and uh, the quality is excellent, much better than hydroponics. Now, aero, uh, aquaponics. Now, this is a system that is not yet popular in India and is getting popular outside and we have all the ingredients that we need to um, get this going. Now please understand why do we need this aquaponics 
as a, a system. And in fact, um, uh, this is by far the best uh, opportunity we have is aquaponics. Now, why? Uh, let me explain a little bit of geopolitics to you. Uh, then we can we'll be able to understand why aquaponics is so important now. Uh, uh, phosphates, phosphorus, uh, is uh, one of the requirements in agriculture as a nutrient. Now, Morocco, of course, was the biggest supplier, then comes to US, was the biggest supplier. Now they've run out of these phosphates. The only country uh, which has phosphates in very large quantities is China. And uh, the whole world's agriculture could be held to hostage uh, by the Chinese but just denying us phosphates. So in fact, that's a one flashpoint and conflict point that one needs to watch for. Now, when you bring in technologies like aquaponics and bioponics, you tend to be, become very efficient in using uh, phosphates. Of course, uh, that's why there's a rush for making biologicals that convert uh, phosphates uh, into ready plant food as phosphate sol solubilizing bacteria. It's BSB, uh, but in aquaponics, it's very easily done uh, because it's a it's a biological system. We have fish wa uh, waste uh, uh, being uh, acted on by bacteria and making into nutrients with the plants take up, and then the cycle continues. Okay, and this is one technology that is is one technology to watch for, and there's a lot of commercial application and. Uh, opportunity in this field. The other field is uh, bioponics. We use uh, we have we have tried we are doing research on bioponics right now. Uh, we've got some success uh, and we're almost there. Bioponics is where you use household material. Uh, uh, let's say like uh, soybean flour, and you you do the thing is that it has to be brewed very but it has to be brewed uh, And we can have uh, uh, a much better system when it comes to sizes. So um, we have at Pune, we've started working on it, and hopefully. Some network issue is there, sir. We are not able to listen to you. If I'm audible, then. Uh... Please note that we are not uh, able to listen to you. You hear me now? Hello? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, sorry, something went wrong. So there was a call coming in on this system. I don't know how. Okay, okay. okay. Um, so, uh, so that's what uh, bioponics we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, uh, automation, and uh, uh, we spoke about it a uh, uh, little briefly. This is where the computer science and electronics people come in, and uh, excellent opportunity here. Most of the systems we have uh, right now are in, uh, imported, and uh, some people are manufacturing local systems, which are good enough, 
but the scope needs to be expanded to various other parameters. Right now, we're controlling uh, the systems to control uh, humidity, uh, temperature, uh, you know, shade uh, shade uh, retraction and uh, uh, opening and closing of shades, opening and closing of vents, turning on and off fans. Um, we have all these things automating different types of nutrients. Uh, we have those systems, but this uh, whole thing needs to be expanded um, uh, in a very inexpensive manner uh, for us to uh, popularize it in the industry. Uh, uh, the So far, these systems uh, are being used, uh, Priva systems, which are uh, probably the world's best, and I like them, but they are very uh, expensive. And uh, then you have, of course, the Blue Lab, they have systems. They're also slightly expensive. Netafilm has Netafilm has systems, which again, again are slightly complicated and expensive. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity in this field to come up with uh, good uh, computer controls, good monitoring system, good sensors. Uh, so uh, data can be collected. And that's one of the things in India we don't have is uh, data. Uh, so uh, if we can get more of these systems developed, more data is generated and we can take better decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, now we have, okay, I'm not getting this. Okay. Now, uh, nothing, you see, any operation uh, in uh, control environment agriculture has to be, uh, you know, it has to have uh, profit mindedness in, in the whole operation also doesn't work. So uh, business management and uh, marketing is, uh, in fact, out of all that uh, technology one side and this on the other side, this is probably as important as the technology, because if you can't market your product, it's pointless. So uh, any entrepreneur coming in, the first thing he should start with is marketing, you know, get see what products are, are going to work, see what products uh, are in demand or you can create a demand for them, uh, see how uh, uh, the systems you want to install, the management systems, the hiring systems and everything, the, your company hierarchy, all these things are going to matter uh, uh, a lot. So uh, basically I just want to uh, use Merrill Jensen's uh, word for controlled environment agriculture is we should strive for high tech and high touch. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't be, uh, we should have the human touch always in there. And, and of course, high, high tech along with high touch uh, is probably the winning situation for us. Next slide, please. Ah, there we are. That's our contact uh, information. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, if there is any time and opportunity, I can take some questions. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for uh, this uh, informative presentation. I think uh, this is the one where all the faculty participants, uh, since we are having the faculty participants from diverse backgrounds, uh, some of them are electrical engineers, some of them are mechanical engineers, some of them are civil engineers and some of them are agriculturists and uh, horticulturists even some of them are students even so this one is the field where uh, you brought all of them together on the same platform and i could see that uh, uh, there was something for everyone's interest now i would request uh, participants to kindly uh, 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 like uh, put on your queries and uh, i i hope i i see that you must be having uh, some queries in your mind because uh, uh, all of you would have seen the something there in this presentation in this lecture of your interest so i'm just requesting participants to kindly uh, ask your queries if you have any hello hello oh, yes I can hear you. Uh, yes, um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm asking the cost of the system which uh, um, is high, which compared to the other uh, one, because uh, the production cost we will get from the uh, system, uh, which is more than the 
the cost of the system which plant the hydrophonics or some other things uh, can you compare the system cost <coughs> yes uh, it all depends on your market research and what type of crop uh, you want to grow okay so let okay, us sir. say you come up with a situation where uh, let us that's the easiest one to explain uh, you come up with a situation okay. where lettuce is good demand in your area and you would like to grow lettuce. Okay. So now the best systems for lettuce are NFT and DFT. Now, depending on your funding sources, your water quality and your know-how, how much you know or how much you want to know and which direction you want to go at, I, I would go with these two technique technologies. Now, again, if you have a long-term view, then go with uh, NFTs because that's more capital uh, intensive, um, uh, but and it's less risk, uh, okay. and you can grow a slightly more different varied crops in there. If you want a short-term uh, approach to it, let's say you want to get out of this, you're just trying it out for two years, three years, then you should go with the deep uh, water culture. Um, here also you could grow almost everything in this, including cucumbers, tomatoes, bell peppers, everything in deep water culture. So um, now, but I think what you are indicating at is an ROI. So um, depending on the price you sell your product yeah. as, your ROI could be anything from three years to five years. Did that answer your question? Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. One more question I have. Sir, uh, the hydro, what is the difference between hydrophonics uh, and uh, aquaphonics? Both same or different or biophonics? Uh, uh, how we can uh, differentiate that? Okay. Uh, hydroponics is uh, basically uh, nutrient water dependent. Okay. Okay. Uh, aquaponics is combining hydroponics and aquaculture, two fields. Aquaculture. Grow, uh, aquaculture that's growing of fish and hydroponics that's growing of plants. So you combine that and make it into aquaponics. Bioponics okay. is a new system that we're trying to develop where we have, we're trying to okay. develop nutrients uh, uh, from okay. very local ingredients. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. I think it is the field where uh, I think a complete uh, FTP can be conducted. <laughs> and uh, all the engineers uh, from diverse backgrounds can participate in that. Yeah, uh, we are also, uh, we are still seeking more questions from the participants. Okay, uh, since there is no query coming from the participant side, so I would request that there's a kindly sum up uh, the today's session. Dr. Sathya Prakasa. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ratnakarai, sir, for Thank the magnific magnificent talk and sharing your great informative ideas with us. And thank you, thank you all the part participants for the, uh, attending this session. And thank you, uh, Dr. Arvind sir, for organizing this uh, uh, session. Thank you so much. So yeah, thank you, we, Mr. sir. Yeah. Can we log out? Yes, sir. Uh -huh, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Now it's a request to all the participants. Uh, they may leave the meeting and uh, will unite again at uh, 11:45 hours. I would say, because from 12 o'clock uh, the new session will start. Okay, so it is a request that all the participants can leave the meeting for now and uh, they can join back on time at 11:45. At least 15 minutes in advance, uh, the session begins. Okay, so we'll meet again around 12 o'clock uh, in the session number five. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, sir.